Lecture 11. Quick review of uh, Lecture 10's discussion of uh, the scaling transformation between Lagrange and Hamiltonian is uh, a very important part of all, all the physics we do, as is the first Lagrange and Hamilton differential equations as we discuss also in uh, Lecture 10. Then I want to make some sense out of that stuff by uh, introducing uh, something that's really famous, the Poincaré or Legendre uh, contact transformations, which lets you co convert a Hamiltonian to a Lagrangian and vice versa. It's a very simple little transformation that has immense physics underneath it. And while we're doing that, I'm going to give you a preview of how this carries through to relativistic quantum mechanics, which is um, actually the diagram that's sitting on the uh, screen to the extreme uh, left uh, here. I will also show a simple example from thermodynamics. Thermodynamics is famous for the confusion of partial derivatives and total derivatives. And this is a really good uh, chance to get a, a hand on that as well. That's the part of thermodynamics that people uh, complain about the most. And the Legendre transformation uh, has a special case. Uh, uh, it is a special case of a general contact transformation. And uh, this is where the concept of action that we talked a little bit about uh, before uh, returns. Then I want to take it down to the level of sophomore physics. I'd like to show a contact transformation solving a sophomore physics problem. A sophomore physics problem that I'm talking about is trajectories. But we're going to do a whole family of trajectories uh, using this technique. And um, we'll do a simple algebra calculus development of what I call the volcanoes of EO. Well, I don't call it. That's what it's called by NASA. The EO has a lot of volcanoes that are uh, like exploding all the time. Yes? Uh, but when you say trajectories, you mean projectile motions, the two-dimensional motions? Yeah, there's parabolas. Uh, okay. Yeah, vacuum, uh, constant gravity, uh, all the stuff that we do in sophomore physics has this uh, structure hiding behind it that uh, is uh, very, very beautiful. And uh, the volcanoes of EO, I think, are some of the most beautiful uh, things that have come out of the space program. But we also do the same thing in a very small scale, what I call the atoms of NIST. Well, NIST is National Institutes of Standards and Technology. And this is a technique uh, to uh, send um, <coughs> alkali atoms like lithium that have um, very nice spectra that can be used to make a very precise atomic clock. And the object is to uh, only interrogate the atoms that are not moving. So they make a little fountain similar to or analogous to the volcanoes on EO, but at a much smaller uh, and much colder um, level of uh, excitation. And the idea is to uh, have a laser interacting with the atoms at the very peak of a um, parabola and uh, therefore capture it when it isn't moving uh, to give you a Doppler error uh, in your uh, very precise measurements of time. So uh, <clears throat> that is what we're going to discuss uh, most of today, I think. And the uh, intuitive geometrical development, as opposed to the algebra calculus development, will give you a chance to use some of the parabolic geometric tricks that uh, we've talked about already with regard to uh, the uh, curves of potential uh, that we talked about for inside the Earth uh, harmonic oscillators. And later we're going to do this technique on a whole family of trajectories inside the Earth, but that'll be um, a later lecture and uh, a later uh, problem uh, set. So let's begin by looking at the stuff we talked about last time, which are essentially three ways to express energy. In this case, 
kinetic energy only. We're just talking about uh, the kinetic energy formulas that we use to develop uh, collisions of multiple particles uh, with each other. We talked first about the super ball and the pin velocities for that experiment that shot the uh, pin into uh, the ceiling. And uh, the Lagrangian plot of V1 versus V2 was the ticket to solving that. And also in, in uh, the logic of mechanics, by uh, assuming that uh, momentum, total momentum, or uh, in, any sort of momentum that isn't uh, forced, free momentum, is conserved, we proved just from that axiom that kinetic energy also is uh, conserved if time reversal symmetry uh, is, the, um, is, is in effect. And uh, this kinetic energy expression here is an equation for uh, an ellipse in velocity space. And this is the matrix equation uh, for that. And um, that uh, is what we did first in chapter 5. Yeah. We just write half mv squared as half times uh, matrix V times matrix M times matrix V because all these things are uh, classical quantities. Had they been quantum mechanical operators, we should be careful with the ordering, right? Like how we multiply them. Well, th this is only distantly uh, analogous to a, a quantum mechanical operator. Uh, this is actually much simpler than most quantum mechanical operators for two states. It's zero and zero here. But we're going to be generalizing that at some point in a few weeks. So I'm writing this equation that will be just as good uh, for all of those cases. No complex numbers here. Quantum mechanics would have matrices with complex numbers, as you know. So this is, as you recall, the thing that let us have the geometry of the Lagrangian, right? For the uh, super ball that was very large and the pen that was very small, this was an ellipse. It was very long, right? Um, <clears throat> with major uh, radius uh, equal uh, to square root of m1, if m1 was the large one, and the minor radius square root of m2, proportional to it, divided by 2 e, all that, twice the uh, actual value of the energy. So this is one way to do classical mechanics. So I call it the uh, French way, after Lagrange. Lagrange is very, very French. The opposite way is this number three, the Hamiltonian. Uh, explicit function here of the uh, the a, a rescale velocity that is velocity that uh, has been multiplied by m here uh, to give momentum. The uh, expression for uh, that is just in matrix form here, uh, written this way. But it would be a valid um, equation for more general things that we'll talk about later on. But you can see the equations for energy are different if P1 uh, is M1V1, then uh, the energy M1V1 squared term becomes a P1 squared term over M1. So you have a square of M1V quantity, you have to lose one of those m one so you have to put the M1 in, in the de denominator. Well, that has a matrix equation too, in this case, uh, this is the inverse mass matrix, inverse to this matrix. Very simple to take an inverse when you don't have any off-diagonal uh, components. So this uh, is an equation for an ellipse that uh, instead of being long like this for that Super Bowl problem, is uh, long this way. And we'll show pictures of both of those. In between these two is a circle. If you simply scale by the square root of the mass, we found a very convenient geometry. This is the one that wins the geometric contest because then the energy is expressed by simply a sum of squares. And this equation right here has a one for a matrix. So uh, taking the square root of, of that out of the thing gives us an energy function that is simply V1 squared plus V2 squared. Uh, all multiplied by uh, one 
have. Okay, the pictures of these is what we reviewed uh, very briefly. Uh, let me jump to that just uh, very quickly here. As I said before, this would be an equation for a typical Lagrangian where these are uh, Lagrangian equal constant lines, topography lines if you were. You can imagine a bowl uh, going into the board and then if you were to extend it, uh, it would be a parabolic elliptical bowl uh, coming out of the board. So is this one, but turned the other way. Now let me go back uh, to the algebra again here because here's where we introduce the partial differential equations of mechanics that apply if there's no potential. This is energy of kinetic type only. And we had the uh, concept that the Lagrangian and the Strangian have their particular functionality, Lagrangian a function of velocity, the Strangian a function of that scaled velocity with the square roots of m. Uh, but neither of them have any explicit dependence on momentum. And so today is the day where we're going to settle uh, what it really means to have the, these two equations seldom written in mechanics books, but they should be on the cover. Because this is where you de declare that the Lagrangian shall not be uh, a function explicitly of momentum. That is, its partial derivative in the uh, general sense that we're going to discuss uh, is identically zero, as, and if we're talking about the Strangian, uh, that. We're not going to uh, worry about Strangian now. I say forget the Strangian for now, but do recall the dual ellipse geometry of a lecture 10 on page uh, 45 uh, to 55. We discussed a, a number of things there that are helpful uh, for what we're going to do today. Uh, now, Hamiltonian Strangian, neither of them have explicit velocity dependence. So the Hamiltonian shall not be uh, explicitly related or explicitly defined by velocity. And then the Lagrangian uh, here, uh, of course, not a function of, I don't know what you're going to call this funny velocity with the square root of m. I just call it speed and m. Okay. That not exactly rolls off your tongue, but uh, maybe someday some people will see the advantage of this function enough to give it a name uh, that sticks. In any case, we're going to forget about that. Mainly, we're going to look at these two guys right here, the partial derivative of h of, of respect to v, 0, and the partial l of respect to p, uh, 0. And we did a little bit of this uh, other way. Now, the uh, following uh, discussion is of some dependencies that are valid in spite of this, what I call the under-the-table uh, connections. Uh, the, that's what we've got to settle today. We have to uh, understand really how these dependencies, how I can make a statement like this and have it really be super meaningful. Uh, at first it looks maybe wrong, uh, but uh, it, uh, I'll, I'll show you why it's definitely right. In any case, if you take a partial derivative of L with respect to V, and that's um, the partial derivative of V of this, we've already uh, discussed it geometrically and uh, algebraically, that that gives you uh, M dot V or P. So that's our first Lagrange equation, uh, that the partial derivative of L with respect to V is P. And this is in a vectorial sense, at, uh, as in uh, the books uh, like Jackson. Or in tensor notation, tensor vector notation, partial derivative of L with respect to uh, a V. We're going to start getting persnickety about these in the next lecture, um, whether where the indices go for covariant and contravariant uh, quantities. But for now, I'll use what's standard for almost all the uh, textbooks that, in mechanics that I know of. And this is the other one, the partial derivative of h with respect to p. Um, the gradient of h with respect to p. And that I'm going to show uh, using the geometry uh, that I uh, talked about 
uh, before. So this is the final part of the review here. The idea is that if I take a velocity gradient in the space of the Lagrangian, which is the velocity space, at some point v, that will be a vector in the normal to that surface at that point, that is perpendicular to the tangent line. Okay, And if I do a uh, similar thing uh, with the uh, Hamiltonian, that is, it's dependent on momentum, so I can take a non-zero gradient of that, uh, there will uh, arise the velocity. So the upshot of that is as shown uh, over here, we'll get on this side of it, so I can point at it without covering it up. The um, gradient that I talked about that gives you momentum should be this uh, arrow right here. That's grad Lagrangian, which is m dot v. And there's where that geometry of the ellipsis comes in. And uh, then the gradient with respect to p at a particular momentum point that's connected to this one this, in this way uh, gives a normal as well. Okay? And the, together they make a nice parallelogram. p on this side, v on that side. Okay? That's the uh, basic idea of the geometry of this. Now this, is, this generalizes to any number of dimensions. This is uh, just the two-dimensional case here uh, that you're looking at. But uh, it is a very, uh, very important uh, sort of uh, connection, both algebraic and geometric. So uh, these are the, the uh, main things that I wanted to uh, review before we go on. I have a question about it. Uh, what is the tangent to the ellipse? Like, uh, uh, the, so the blue ellipse is, that's the, that's the Lagrangian? That's the Lagrangian in its space. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, here's the Hamiltonian living in yes. Ireland. Yes. This is in France. Right. Okay. Right. Never the twain shall meet. Ah, uh, but in America we mix our races, right? Good. We get some real advantages of doing that. Okay? And th this shows you it. Now, they aren't always the uh, same shape, or I mean they're the same shape, but they're not always the same size. If I'm dealing with less mass, then because the mass is in the denominator of the Hamiltonian, uh, it will shrink, Lagrangian grow. Okay. Vice versa, more mass than the Hamiltonian uh, uh, is a bigger one, and the uh, Lagrangian scale is smaller. Okay, but still that relationship holds. The scale invariant. Okay. So this is an illegal thing we're doing here. So that taking the Hamiltonian world and putting it on top of the Lagrangian world. So on, on the left plot, where you have the vector v, so the, that is the this is velocity and yeah. you know all of the collision stuff we did. So which means on particle one. one has velocity v one and particle two has velocity v two, and that's the point. And then at that point you draw a tangent to the ellipse. So what does the physically what is a tangent? What does a tangent represent, Dr. Hunter? Well, first of all, um, a tangent would represent a partial derivative with respect to r, but I would prefer to refer you to the gradient because that's what we want to look at. That's fine. We want to look at the normal right. rather than the tangent. Okay. And See. that's why this p is a gradient with respect to v of the Lagrangian function of velocity. Okay. And that is the first Lagrange equation. That's the equation uh, that's sitting so uh, right up here. Okay, partial derivative of L with respect to velocity. Now, velocity is written as a Q dot in the notation we're about to learn in the next uh, lecture. Uh, so, but so right now we can just write it like to, uh, your favorite friend, uh, John David Jackson. So what you do is you draw the tangent to at that point and then draw normal to the tangent at that point and that is your momentum. That, that will be the direction of the momentum. momentum. And the question is, 
Well, uh, how long is it? Well, it's exactly that long. It, it's whatever it takes in that direction to hit the uh, Hamiltonian ellipse. So, so far we only know the direction, right. okay. but where this guy helps us find the length, so and then vice versa. So when you, if you want P1, you take the gradient with respect to V1. If you want P2, you take the gradient with respect to V2. Yeah. Yeah. So what we have here is a funny kind of transformation from Lagrangian to Hamiltonian. Now if we can sort that out, that will be the Legendre transformation. The Legendre contact transformation. Contacting because it's contacting with tangents to make normals that contact other tangents that make the other normal and then you're back around the uh, circle, so to speak, here. It's parallel here. Okay? So that, that's what we really want to learn today at the first part of this lecture is how that connection, that Legendre connection, now we're back in uh, France again, but uh, Hamilton uh, sort of did this is on his own uh, in the misty moors of Ireland. So again, oh. uh, so even on the Hamiltonian ellipse, you do the same thing, right? Brother? You draw, you fix the momentum, yeah. and then you draw a tangent to that momentum, and at that point you draw a normal to that tangent. Yeah, it's going to be in this direction, but I don't know where yet. i got to come back to France, find out what, what that is. So I have one more question. Like when you put these two plots together, what about the scale? Because these two... Well, as I said, it really doesn't matter. I picked a very convenient scale where they're the same size. And remember when we did our ellipse geometry, uh, we started with that. Then I said, oh no, let's rescale it. Uh, the scale that we finally settled on that's really most convenient for doing geometry is to fix it so this guy is inside that guy. Or vice versa, you could put this guy in scale it so it's inside that. These are different dimensions, these spaces, right? So scale them whatever you want. It's not going to change this because the directions are all, all proportional. So it sounds like you superimpose one plot on top of the yeah. other. You contact them. <laughs> yep. Pretty cool, huh? You see it here, you don't see it in other books. But it's very powerful, as we're going to see. Okay? Now, there is another book that does have some of this. I'm going to show you another diagram of this in, in a little bit. And that's um, Arnold, the great uh, Russian uh, classical mechanic guy who really analyzed uh, in the 1900s the uh, what we call in mathematics is total motion. That's just chaos. We call it chaos. And he used a diagram like we're going to show uh, the lit in a little bit here. All right. Um, let's go. Uh, the Legendre contact transformation that lets us get between these two uh, quantities of uh, velocity and momentum. Now this is a little squirrely. This is, um, I'm coming at this with a hand-waving derivation that uh, we're going to get very solidly uh, derived by algebra in um, the next lecture. But now I'm, I'm using uh, a little bit of the um, sort of geometric intuition uh, that the elliptical stuff uh, has generated. And here's the, the rub. Given a matrix relation P equal M dot V, or its inverse, V equal M inverse dot P, and remember that the action of the ma mass matrix gives you, you see, a, a vector like this. When you perform the, uh, the mass uh, matrix uh, M on V, uh, it gives you P. So this is a, a neat thing to know. I pointed out uh, that that's uh, what matrices do uh, for you, uh, is let you see what their operational effects are. And similarly, uh, you can do an M inverse on the uh, um, P vector, uh, this vector right here, 
and uh, it will give you a vector that is in that direction, that is it will give you this direction which stops on its own uh, Lagrangian ellipse, a velocity function ellipse. Okay, so that's really, you know, really something that you should have in your head as you work with things like this. Quadratic forms in particular. So here's the Lagrangian v dot m dot v. Here's the Hamiltonian p dot m inverse dot p. Okay, these are the two different things we're trying to uh, make a relationship uh, to them. And we can say, oh, I, I can do that easily. I, I know what to do uh, here. I can write uh, this thing uh, very quickly. Uh, I can take uh, the Lagrangian here and say, hey, m dot v is p, isn't it? And so I can write this. And I can look at the Hamiltonian and say, hey, uh, uh, isn't v equal to m inverse p? Can I just put a v here? OK. And uh, both of these say the Hamiltonian and Lagrangian are equal. Which we know they aren't. They aren't even living in the same space. OK. But numerically, they, they are. Numerically, this is true. It's just that we are not just satisfied with being numerically true. We want the functionality, that is the derivatives, to work for these functions. That's what really give us the physics. So uh, we have to ask ourselves, um, is this going to give us what we want? And the answer is no, we have to adjust uh, one or the other or both. Yeah. Uh, originally, it claimed that the Lagrangian doesn't carry any explicit P dependence and Hamiltonian doesn't carry any explicit V dependence. And Are we trying we to, have to get We have to sort this out. You see, you know right away that as far as explicit dependence, we're in trouble here. Right? And then the explicit dependence of this, this is okay, this is not. You see, so we're going to have to sort that out. We're going to have to make that um, right with respect to derivatives, not just the numbers. The numbers, yeah, they're equal. But, um, but for, for proper adjustments of the P's and V's, that's the catch. Okay? So I say possibility numerically correct, always differentially wrong. That's what, what we've got here. So let's, uh, let's uh, make a stab in the dark here. <clears throat> Instead, I say, uh, okay, if it's uh, if this one's going to be p dot v, maybe I try minus a half v dot p or p dot v. Okay, remember these are scalar products in classical physics; uh, those are identical, so don't let that uh, throw you here. Okay, so I'm claiming that actually uh, either one of these could be uh, true. We're going to pick this one. The Lagrangian is p dot v minus h of p. Now, bear with me here. This is uh, uh, something that uh, actually I worked backwards to get this uh, in this particular uh, way. The idea is that now the explicit dependency or non-dependency relations give the right derivatives. Okay? With this arrangement, if I do a partial derivative of L with respect to p, and claim that's zero, then go and do a partial of p with respect to p of this thing, and the only thing that's going to pop up is v. Partial p, p is just a one, uh, and uh, so I get a v there, and then I get a partial respect to p of that, which I, I know uh, is okay with me. And you see right away I get Hamilton's first equation. Same thing if I do a partial respect to V of this Hamiltonian here. I know that's zero, so I write a zero. And then I go and do a partial V of P dot V. Bingo, P. And then there's a partial derivative of L respect to V, which is P. And this is V, canceling this V, as this V cancels that P. Okay? So there you are. If, th if I assume this, I get Hamilton's first equations and Lagrange's first equations, which we absolutely need in order for this geometry uh, to jive with our differential equations. So that uh, 
looks like a trick. It is. This is a trick. But very deep trick. Extremely deep trick. Physically and mathematically. And that's what we need to explain. And this is a, the stuff that is really not explained uh, in so, any of the mechanics books I've So P dot P is not equal to V dot P. Say again. In P dot P is not equal to V dot P. In like oh. quantum mechanics. Yeah. In, in the quantum world of velocity and momentum, we're very seldom going to commute. Yes, I know. And functions of them, you know, if they don't commute, then their functions probably aren't going to do either, although there are rare cases. But uh, that, that's not our problem here. Our problem is purely classical calculus. So we've got to figure out uh, what happened here, what's going on here, why can I. Uh, say that the partial derivative of uh, Lagrangian with respect to P is identically zero, and the partial derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to V identically zero. And I, that's a color error is there. Uh, there is a uh, color coding to this that we'll use throughout this uh, lectures that is equivalent to the red and blue that goes with the uh, Republicans and the Democrats uh, respectively and I'll occasionally make use of political analogies. Okay, now what I'd like to show you is the actual geometry that um, this is giving us. What it's doing is taking a Lagrangian function of velocity. Now remember, I'm now just taking one component, but I could, I could set this underneath this, this um, elliptical paraboloid, I'm cutting it now It's in some direction, say in that direction, okay? And what I'll see there is a, a parabola, okay? And I can cut this one uh, in this direction, okay, or any other direction, and again, uh, see a, a parabola, okay? If I cut the thing in uh, this direction, I get a very flat sort of a parabola like I've sort of sketched in here and if I cut this one uh, you know in roughly the same direction I would be seeing uh, this uh, fairly sharp uh, parabola. But the catch is I have drawn this particular case with actual new numbers on here and the idea is that the velocity v is p slope. Okay, p slope, that's the derivative or only uh, writing without partial, I'm just saying uh, slope on this graph here, and we're just treating one dimension of, of p uh, at a time. The dh dp is here uh, plus one, okay? And so that, uh, uh, let's see, is that right? Uh, yes. The derivative is one, the actual value of the momentum is 1.6 at this particular uh, juncture. And the uh, Hamiltonian, uh, h of p uh, is equal to 0.6, there, there's your uh, 0.6 uh, right there, this is the origin, okay? So this velocity is p slope, or it's the actual um, abscissa, that is the x component of this graph, x y graph, okay? This is Lagrangian as a function of this velocity, okay? Now the v slope is in turn the x coordinate of this one, you see. Okay, so this is putting it down in just simple uh, high school algebra sort of uh, relationship. And while you're at it, since this is an equation, y equals, uh, say, a slope m times x minus whatever this thing is as an intercept, the intercepts here are important. The intercept is where this tangent line hits the uh, main axis. Uh, the p slope line intercept here is at minus the Lagrangian, you see. There's minus the Lagrangian as the intercept of this uh, curve uh, tangent with the uh, uh, vertical uh, axis. So, like there's a plot of Hamiltonian as a function of p where the slope is v and the y-intercept right. is Lagrangian. Uh, Lagrangian whose v, uh, slope is p. 
by our equations, okay? Uh, these are the vector equations, but those, those triangles there are just derivatives in this plane, okay? So, uh, here the Lagrangian, which is this particular value here, is the p slope intercept with a minus sign. That, that is minus p slope intercept, okay? There's a Lagrangian upside down. And meanwhile, this one's intercept, this tangent's intercept here, you, you guessed it, that's the actual value of the Hamiltonian, okay? minus v inner slope, this thing right here, actual, uh, this is minus the Hamiltonian. Well, that's pretty amazing. Now, this is the graph that done in a, in a way that was so hard, first I didn't understand what he was doing, uh, by Arnold. You'll find this in one of his, uh, what people consider completely unreadable now, a uh, mechanics book, it's in the, uh, Yellow Peril series of Springer. It's a mathematical monograph. Okay? So most physicists won't even hear about it. It's hot to be. It's in the Yellow Peril series, they call it. As the mathematicians call it. These are books that are even hard for the mathematicians to read. So, uh, essentially that the figure he has is, is this. It just doesn't have all the arrows and things to show you what's really going on. And um, so what book are you referring to? Is it his aerobatic problems in classical mechanics or is it the mathematics? Well, he has got two books. Son. Arnaud is the um, physic, physicist slash mathematician that really, um, shall we say, analyzed the whole notion of ergodicity, which um, is really synonymous with the field of, that we in America call chaos. Stochastic, stochastic. Uh, behavior of trajectories, which we've, we've fiddled with. We've shown that if you get things just right for oscillators, that you never fill the energy space. You go and make some hexagon or some geometrical figure that keeps uh, tracing itself over. You get a, a punk or a recurrence and periodicity. Uh, the question is, what happens when you have more dimensions and things are, uh, as, we, as we'll see uh, later, uh, can very easily, with nonlinearities, uh, become uh, chaotic and really fill uh, uh, the uh, energy space. And that's he was the one that really um, made sense out of a, a lot of that. There's still more to be done. Okay. Now, uh, I would like to just briefly show you that um, this carries on uh, to relativistic quantum mechanics. Just very quickly here, um, this uh, picture here, this is a preview of unit 8. So uh, what I'm doing here is uh, making a connection between the Hamiltonian that occurs in relativistic uh, quantum mechanics. This is a Hamiltonian that's generic to ordinary classical physics, a nice parabola uh, is the uh, Lagrangian, and a nice uh, flat parabola, uh, in this particular case, is the Hamiltonian. Both of them are just um, one-half mv squared is equal to p squared over 2m numerically. Just uh, the, the derivatives don't work uh, for that. Well, this thing here shows that the Irish curve, that's the Hamiltonian, is not quite a, par a parabola. In fact, it's not at all a parabola. A parabola would continue up like this. This one approaches an asymptote. This one is a hyperbola uh, um, here. Described by hyperbolic functions, cosh and cinch. So this shows rather clearly that the Irish uh, mechanics is, shall we say, uh, free to s go out into the country and uh, even get on a boat, come over to the United States. Okay? Not so much the Lagrangian. The Lagrangian 
also starts out looking like a parabola. Now this is minus a Lagrangian right here, but it's a circle. It's a circle that just stays home, so to speak. It's, it's more French-like. They have very, they're very urbane, those French. Okay, so Lagrangian function right here is definitely a function of what's called group velocity, and that is the velocity that comes out of quantum mechanics to make the velocity we see and love in classical mechanics. So this amazing, and um, PC, PC, why don't you go ahead and just uh, show how you work this graph. It's really uh, quite easy. You get your mouse out and you grab the bullseye down there or up there and just pick whatever velocity uh, you want, starting with zero, okay, and then uh, continue uh, out either way and see the momentum growing on the hyperbola and the Lagrangian diving on the circle. That's your actual values, and you can hook those actual values into control. Yeah, if you want to do a precise part. Sure. It's like a little calculator, relativistic calculator. Yeah. Go ahead and take it over to the extreme right. And what I want uh, you to see are these intercepts. See the tangent there? The slope of that tangent is the velocity. This tangent right here. Remember we said that the slope of this tangent uh, was the momentum, okay? That was the, uh, the slope of the tangent on the Lagrangian. That's also true. Here's the tangent on the Lagrangian right here, and it intercepts right here at the value of the Hamiltonian. And its numerical value is uh, the velocity, the velocity, the group velocity. And this is uh, this guy, this guy right here intercepts down here. Okay. Well, this is the intercept area, obviously equal to the the Hamilton, the Lagrangian right here. So this Hamiltonian tangent intercepts to uh, make the Lagrangian value, which is this, and then this one, this tangent off of the Lagrangian intercepts right here to make the value that is the Hamiltonian. And this is true no matter how fast you go. And you're going relativistic speeds right there. So I thought you ought to see this, and this is going to be featured in a, our INBRI um, workshop. And in the week after that, we'll be delivering a colloquium that develops this. So we're going to... You're going to give a talk here now? On November 14th. Oh, okay. Eighth, yeah. Eighth but November 7th, we've got a workshop in this room uh, that we'll go over. We'll have you know, people doing eighth. some of this. November 8th. November 8th is Saturday. November 7th to the Friday. That's when Inbury starts and it ends on the 8th. Oh, yeah. Please come. 10 o'clock in the morning. Oh, okay. <laughs> this, this talk will you'll be prepared for the states if you're ready for it. Yeah, you'll have a few people who can tell what's going on <laughs> in this uh, business. Okay, so I wanted you to see that. Now this doesn't come up until uh, Unit 8 in a classical mechanics book, but you know I couldn't leave it out. The geometry of Legendre contact transformation persists in relativistic quantum field theory. Okay. Uh, it is in fact due to the wave mechanics in phase invariant principle, I mean quantum phase. I just have one question. In classical mechanics, both Hamiltonian and Lagrangian are functions. Whereas in quantum mechanics, Hamiltonian is an operator, whereas Lagrangian is still a function, it's not an operator because we just write Lagrangian well, function. So Lagrangian has to be re-expressed. Um, and the way that's done, uh, and we don't use Lagrangians that much except for very high energies. You see, uh, one of the things that you'll see from uh, this particular one, I guess I have to bring her back uh, here real quickly to answer your question. Uh, what is uh, true is the Lagrangian, which is a function of velocity, is limited by the speed of light. So as I approach the speed of light, I get down in here, and I have a very small value of the Lagrangian. You see, and that's much easier to work with. So high energy physicists like to uh, deal uh, with that, and that's why you'll see Lagrangian as a, a main driver uh, in high energy and even nuclear physics. Uh, meanwhile, uh, we like to work with Hamiltonians because of 
most of our work is somewhere inside where I am right now, and most of our work, of course, is, is you know, right there within a pixel at the top, okay? When we're within a pixel at the top, then uh, if you blow that up, you'll get this picture. But, uh, somebody in quantum mechanics, is Lagrangian an operator, uh, or is it still a function of functional? Function, it's, it's a it's function. functional. Yeah. So, so will, will the mathematical form of Legendre transformation change? Because on one hand you have an operator, on the other hand you have functional. You have to build an operator for equal velocity. Okay. And they don't bother to do that because they just work with the wave functions directly. Um, well, I mean, somebody ought to uh, explore that. That's a, an interesting question, actually. This, um, don't be so married to operators. You know, the no notion of quantizing by formulas that give you operators. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about that, how it comes out of this, but it's very questionable. Better to look at what the waves are doing, and uh, that's the uh, real role here. Okay. This is how the classical contact transformations work. In other words, how, how is it that I can say that the derivative of H with respect to V is zero? Or the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to P is zero? When I know darn well that both of these things depend, at least not uh, uh, formally, if not formally, certainly numerically in typical uh, problems that you've worked already uh, on both things. How, how do we uh, make sense of that? Okay, let's take the Lagrangian, the, the, the one that I had uh, just a minute ago uh, on the uh, graph here. I'm going to take uh, the right-hand side first, and then we'll look a little bit at the other one, which will be very similar to this one. Here's the deal on this. have a function of v. It's appearing to be, if I don't move p and h much, a linear function of v. Okay, so I'm going to uh, try to hit that function with some straight lines. Well, if I put a straight line here with a uh, intercept value of this particular uh, h, and uh, let's assume for a moment that I could just go ahead and say how big is the intercept uh, for a particular velocity, v minus 3, then v minus 2, then v minus 1, then v, the point I'm interested in, okay? As I do that, I get a um, increase in h or a decrease in the intercept. Put it here, line hits it once. Put it here, line hits it probably once. Who knows? Not probably twice, but uh, uh, on this graph that I've drawn, as far as I've drawn, it hits it once, okay? Then, as I start to get close, as I start to get this uh, H here uh, close, and, and now it, it, as I move up the, the thing, it doesn't change very much. I'm down here, and here is the limit point. That is when uh, this curve is tangent to the... Thing. Then the two points that were intersecting before come together, meaning right there. Tangent line points to the extreme value of the Hamiltonian, which is its intercept. And it's an extreme value. Uh, I go back up the sign here, comes, it just comes back. It's, it's quadratic, roughly, in that neighborhood, even if the Lagrangian wasn't quite quadratic. Okay. So, at that point, we have an extreme value. An extreme value means the derivative of this thing with respect to velocity is zero. That's what this equation right here means. It means that we're taking this at the extremes in this uh, contact transformation. This is a contact transformation that cannot be a secant. I want it to be contacting. One point. So this leads to a unique tangent curve at the contact point, velocity zero, that has max h 
in this case, but it could be men if things were turned around. Okay. So when you say Thus, the derivative of h with respect to v is zero at that point. So which means the energy is maximum? Is it max h? The value of this function, if it were a function of v, is maximum. And that's the only point I'm going to consider. Only point I'm going to consider is the one for which dh dv is zero. Which means this is consistent with the claim that Hamiltonian doesn't carry explicit velocity dependence. That's right. This is how it doesn't, <laughs> if that makes sense. This is how it doesn't depend on V. Now we play this game with the Hamiltonian, the other side of the graph. Okay, secant lines for HP are PV minus L. I mean, you just flip the two around, okay? Same deal. Now it's this very flat thing. I'm working my secants in. You see, I had uh, Lagrangians that way the heck up here. I keep dropping them, keep dropping them, keep dropping them. Okay, which means I'm uh, making the L bigger. I'm looking for, again, a maximum value, extreme value of minus L will intercept right there. And at that point, the, der the derivative of Lagrangian with respect to the P's that we've been trying out, zero at the one I want. So this one is the guy that says that Lagrangian uh, shall have no p dependence. In order for it to be contacting, it, that's what we, we want. Now, um, as I've said, this whole structure makes no sense to a classicist. But when we come down and actually look at the waves that are behind this, and this particular uh, uh, Legendre function, uh, I, I put it at the top of the, uh, of the list of my equations, top and center uh, uh, over here on the wall where I'm writing an H as a P V minus L in the notation that we'll soon be familiar with here, or L equal to P uh, Q dot P V uh, minus H. Uh, th those are uh, called uh, Poincaré expressions as well as Legendre transformations. Uh, in that sheet of paper where you have written H equals P plus V of Q, the parentheses you say in fixed GCC. So what is a GCC? Now say, say that again. In, in, that, uh, in the paper where you have got uh, uh, the Hamiltonian written down? Yes, here's a. Yeah, H I mean, equals basically it's, it's these um, <coughs> equations oh, okay. right here. Okay. H equal P times velocity okay. minus L. GCC. Oh, okay, I was just asking what GCC is. Say again. He was wanting the definition of GCC. The definition of Q? No. What the anacronym GCC stands for. Oh, GCC. Yeah. That comes back to what we call generalized curvilinear coordinates. Okay, which we're going to be introducing to not tomorrow, the next day. Okay, next lecture. Yes, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. And, and then we'll come back and re-derive all of this stuff from the way it's usually done. It completely hides all this. Completely hides it. It's hiding the quantum mechanics behind classical. If you think as many textbooks imply that you can derive quantum mechanics from classical. That's no, that's going to get you in trouble. That's just going to confuse you. That is as silly as deriving classical mechanics from Aristotelian mechanics. Aristotelian mechanics is force equal mass times velocity. They're always in the mud with a heavy wagon, and if it's a heavier wagon, you have to push harder to get a velocity. You want more velocity, you've got to push harder and harder, and so on, right? You're never going to get Newtonian mechanics out of that. And you're never going to get the quantum mechanics out of classical because you're missing the underlying phase of mass. That's what's, you're just not conscious of that. You're not talking about this is probing that. This is probing that. 
and that's what making all this work. This is a Huygens contact transformation here. Uh, if you know about how waves make the next wave by Huygens contact transformations. We'll talk about that. But this is the uh, basic idea here. So partial derivative of h equal with respect to velocity equals zero. At each point v equal partial derivative of h with respect to p of the L of v where the slope is p equal at partial L with respect to v. Vice versa when you're talking about the Hamiltonian mechanics. So pretty screwy, I have to admit. But this, if I'm going to talk classical mechanics and really explain what the Legendre contact transformation and make connections with what we call the reigning science right now, and that's the quantum theory, uh, this is the door, uh, doorway. Okay, let's take a more less heavy uh, example of the uh, contact uh, transformation. Uh, if you've taken thermodynamics, you probably saw that after you got done studying internal energy, which you do in sophomore physics, you started defining it as a function of S and V. Well, S is entropy, and V is volume. So that is a typical internal energy uh, function. And it, they're very persnickety about this. They say you don't even talk about your internal energy unless you are talking about entropy and volume. Okay? But if you want to uh, talk about entropy and pressure, then you introduce a new function called enthalpy, H. And it depends on this entropy S and pressure. We're just talking about a theory of gases, uh, not even ideal gases, uh, non-ideal gases, possibly. So, uh, the, well, this uh, HSP is a Legendre transformation of the internal energy. You simply have to add a product of P and V. Does that look familiar? Uh, and the idea is it's a function of new variable P, and P is a partial derivative of U with respect to V, internal energy with respect to uh, volume, for constant entropy. Okay, let's rephrase this. Lagrangian L of R and velocity, now V and V here, that's kind of nice, lowercase v for velocity, uppercase v for volume, okay? Sorry about the S, that'll have to be the R that we talk about when we talk about Lagrangian S potential. We haven't been, so we don't really care so much what we name that, is defined as a function of position, if it's got potential, we, ours didn't, we didn't look at that yet, and Velocity V instead of volume V for the uh, internal energy. Okay, so this is the analogy between Lagrangian internal energy playing that role. Entropy plays a role of position. We don't care too much about that. We keep it constant. A uh, volume uh, here V is uh, playing the role of velocity in the stuff that we have been doing uh, with our Lagrangian. Okay, a new function H. Fortunately, H and H the same. Hamiltonian instead of enthalpy, okay, is a function of R, well that's the entropy, and P, that's the pressure. P, momentum, P, pressure. Isn't this a nice little rhyme I've got going here? Okay. Depends on the entropy, okay, that's position R, uh, and pressure, P, that's momentum, P. So, read Hamiltonian is a function of position of momentum, whereas Lagrangian is a function of position of velocity, okay. It, being this new guy, okay, is a Legendre transformation that is momentum times velocity minus Lagrangian. Well, there's a difference in sign here, so that shows up over here. But aside from the, the sign differences, aside from the differences, it's our Hamiltonian going from Lagrangian L. To use a new variable momentum, not pressure, but momentum, which is the partial derivative of this guy with respect to velocity for constant everything else. Okay? Just to give you an, a, a heads up that thermodynamics is full of this stuff. 
So when you said uh, P is partial derivative of Lagrangian uh, with respect to velocity at a constant x, it means you fix a point in space and then you calculate what the velocity is. Fix a point uh, in at a given yeah, point. Yeah, at a given point. That's right. Yeah. This would be true. You have to do this if the Lagrangian is also a function of that R. Okay. Rs haven't been, yeah. but later on it will be. And when you say partial derivative, you, that's implied. Thermodynamicists uh, write their textbooks uh, with partial derivatives in them, which already says all the other independent variables are constant, right? But they have to remind the engineering students, and that's what this really means. So they put a little subscript or uh, parentheses that says, you know, if I see this letter here, it's being held constant. Okay. Um, what I uh, would like to uh, point out to you, just to get you uh, used to thinking this way, is that the Legendre transformation is a special case of a general contact transformation. What is a general contact transformation? Um, some people will call this an active contact transformation generator or an action function. Okay, this you, you, you want to make a transformation between uh, stuff that's in a space, say, y, x, lowercase y, lowercase x, got a function there, okay? And I want to uh, see how things are like if I use a new variable, a y, big y and big x, uppercase y and uppercase x, uh, and I now have some, I want to see how this function turns up over here. That's a what's called a general contact transformation. Now here's how you do it. Um, this new y of x is mapped from a uh, from y of x as a contacting. I didn't put well. I put it here. Envelope of contacting s equal a constant curves. So you you have a active transformation function that does the mapping. It's a function of both x and y little and x and y big. And there should be a colon between there to indicate these are two different spaces that we're uh, mapping between. So what you do is you pick a point here, say x0 and y of x0. We assume we have a function in this space. okay? And I plug it in uh, to this, uh, to this uh, function here, this x0 and y0. And I, I plot that function out. Now remember, I don't know this one yet. This is uh, going to be a result, okay? So I, I plot that function, okay? Big deal, all right? Then I go on. I put in x1 and y1, okay? Determined by this curve, okay? And I plot that function. And then I go to x2. I plot that function. If Though, and, and remember, these are continuous and differentiable, so each one isn't too different from that. But where the difference shows is right along a, a region where you can imagine a curve contacting. Have you ever seen a transformation like this, any of you, besides in this room? Well, yes, you have. Huygens, right? How do you make waves in Huygens world? You have a wave front, which could be this thing right here. At every point on that thing, you draw a circle. Okay? You keep drawing a bunch of circles and you'll get a continuous new wavefront, right? Now, you draw those circles according to index of refraction, so they might be bigger here and they might be small here, in which case your curve, your wavefront's going to bend. That's the kind of thinking you've got to get into if you're going to be really cognizant of what goes on in quantum dynamics. Because it's all waves. Everything that happens is due to wave motion. It's only occasionally proximal. Now this is a Legendre constant, you see. It's doing by contacting straight lines. A whole bunch of straight lines go together to make the new curve. If I have a Lagrangian, I make the Hamiltonian out of the contacting of all of those uh, different uh, things that obey the equation we just uh, talked about. Now I'm starting to use a notation that we'll be using later on. Q's uh, for coordinates, Q dots for velocities. P, uh, we already have in music. Okay?
No, it goes backwards. Vice versa. This time I pick big X and big Y each time, draw a curve there. It better line up. Okay? So that uh, is um, a quick thing. Now, this is a very important function we're going to talk about later on. The differential with respect to time. LDT, that's called DS, where S is the action function. DS is PDQ minus HDT. We're going to play with that a lot. The reason that quantum mechanics are interested in this is because P is proportional to K. So this is K DX minus H is proportional to omega with a Planck's constant, omega DT. So this is a differential of quantum phase, the quantum phase, the overall quantum phase of the system is what we're talking about. One phase differential. So this is what we're playing. This is an extraordinary claim. needs an extraordinary proof. And that's what we're going to try to do in uh, chapter 12 of this unit. But you really need to go to unit 8 to start playing with that sort of thing, which is what uh, is the uh, one mechanics with all the stops pulled out. All right, let's do something more elementary. We have enough time here, I think, to at least get this to the point where you can read about it and um, have some fun with it. Uh, we're going to give a problem uh, that asks you to do this with ruler and compass, sort of. Um, basic idea is that if you blow off a bunch of particles at a constant velocity in all different directions uh, in a uniform gravitational field, or in a not so uniform gravitational field, but it won't be that much difference if your volcano is only about that height. It's when uh, this thing would blow the volcano out so big that it made elliptical orbits instead of parabolical orbits. These are all, of course, approximate uh, parables that would be elliptical on a real planet. Uh, in a small chamber like this, we would never make a distinction between those, but basically what is going on here is they're going puff with some lithium atoms. They, uh, they send up uh, in the gravitational field to fall. So that's, that's what we want to uh, analyze. And um, this set of curve, these, these points here, we're going to see if those lie on a circle. But every one of them is part of a parabolic trajectory that makes a contact to the contacting envelope, which I want to show you how to calculate uh, that contacting envelope the, the easiest way I know of, uh, using algebra. And then we'll let the geometry uh, tell us the same answer. So uh, this thing I call the atom ball. Atom starts, atom, a circle, go poof, very precise uh, poof, so to speak, that makes us a circular expanding thing that has uh, come off of something that was uh, rising. So it is a rising, expanding ball. Okay, it goes poof, comes out, and you're just seeing it when it's really large and it's fallen almost off the screen here. So this atom ball, as I say, expands at a constant rate, V0, whatever you want poof with, as the center falls at a constantly increasing rate GT, you know your sophomore physics, as a velocity going up with time times the acceleration, which is constant, and is maintaining two contact points with the envelope after reaching the highest point. So it starts out a circle, it's not touching the envelope, but then it touches it right here, and then the contact point is going to be moving out um, very non-uniformly. That's the geometry we need to study here. But first we do the um, the uh, basic sophomore physics UP1 formulas for trajectories and constant gravity. X is equal to uh, good old V0 cosine of alpha. It's a uh, horizontal projection of the velocity times time. That will not change. That can be easily integrated uh, to give us uh, the X position. X equal that velocity times time. Okay, starting from initial value. The y is the one that's got the gravity uh, term in it. It would be a, not, it'd be a uniform uh, circle expanding and not moving. This is going to make the circle drop. 
So I'm going to replace time, which uh, comes from this equation, as an inverse cosine of alpha. We put that in here uh, for the time and time squared. Okay. So there's the uh, trajectory equation that's only a function of x and y and not time uh, for a given alpha and a given initial velocity. So how does this uh, make a contact transformation? This is what we're going to see uh, here. So here is the equation from the sophomore physics. I'm going to turn it around by simply putting all the stuff that it says on the right hand side. Okay? So this I'm going to define as a contact generating function, an action function. Okay? Minus y plus x times alpha. Minus y because I brought it over. Everything else is the same from here on. And it's going to say it's zero. That's true, isn't it? If I take everything I'll put on the right hand side. Okay? So we're going to start with the velocity alpha space. I can pick the initial velocity, that's sort of an angle of launch, and, uh, I'm sorry, a speed of launch, and then angle of launch. The alpha here, say 45 degrees, the alpha here closer to 60, this uh, maybe 80 or so degrees, okay? So I go uh, 45, 60, and 75 actually are the two points that I'm taking here for constant velocity. So here's the curve that I want to uh, make a contact transformation out of. And the idea is that each one of these curves will at some point contact an envelope. That's what I want to solve for. I want to solve for the envelope that's given. So I want to turn this line through the contact transformation into that line. Okay. Now this is something that really should be in every calculus course, and, and most of the time uh, I don't find it uh, there. So this may be the first time you've uh, seen this little trick. It used to be on the old calculus, but you can find uh, the, these uh, things. I don't explain it very well. We're doing it in a very physical sort of way, so you can make the explanation a little quicker. The envelopes of the uh, V0 trajectory region, you see, contain extremal, remember the idea of extremal contact point with each trajectory, okay? And that's where, that's where the function is least dependent, that is, virtually not dependent on alpha. So as I change alpha, you see, uh, here, all I do is just slide this thing a little bit that way, but that doesn't affect uh, much because it's practically flat. In fact, it's touching that curve both in value and tangent. So the point where this thing is extreme, that's equivalent to the thing that made our uh, partial derivative of Lagrangian with respect to momentum zero type uh, argument is, is right there. That's the thing we're going to solve. So we have to take this function and set its alpha derivative to zero and find out uh, where things are as a result of that. So when I take the partial derivative of this thing with respect to, the first thing I do is get a partial derivative of tangent alpha with respect to alpha. There's no dependency. These are partials now. Everything constant except for the thing we're, we're filling with here. And uh, then I've got to take a partial derivative of the uh, cosine to the minus 2 power, okay? So this is non-trivial calculus. It's part of the reason it got thrown out, I guess. I don't want to scare people. But uh, you can find the tangent alpha be secant uh, squared. Uh, well, that's uh, x over cosine squared. And then this one's not so bad. You just get a couple of factors of 2 things uh, coming in the denominator with minus 3 power, okay? which cancel out rather nicely. So we get a thing that looks like this, tangent alpha to v0 of gx, or x equals v0 uh, squared over g tan alpha. But we want x as a function of y. So we have to go back and put it in here, get rid of the alphas. So that's what, what we do. We go back to the y of x equals x tan alpha. Okay, we put tan alpha in there as that. Put these two guys in there, you see, and uh, 
Well, work it out yourself in detail. I put enough clues on here that you will very soon see that the Y of X for the envelope, the dash curve, is this thing. B0 squared over 2G minus GX squared. Of course, it's an inverted parabola. Now, Mahatma, I have a question. There it is. Uh, how do you draw parabolas? Are, are those parabolas or are those ellipses? That each of these? Yeah, each of these. Is it are each of those an ellipse that... Well, that is going to be your problem. And I'm thank you for reminding me that we're going to have one for inside the Earth. We're going to have a, this neutron starlet uh, run into some ur a uranium patch and blow up a bunch of neutron off of the surface. Okay? All with constant velocity. Assume. Okay? Yeah. Because when so you say alpha is then you're going, to get, uh, you're going to get something else uh, for uh, this curve. But here, with uniform gravity, mm -hmm. these are parabolas, okay, so and so is this, perfectly, right? So when you say alpha is 45 degrees, it means that you draw a tangent uh, at that point, from, starting which from point? the uh, here, well, for, the red, here. for the red, for the red, one. yeah. So you say alpha is 45 degrees. So does that mean that you draw a tangent to that parabola? Uh, uh, you bet. And whenever, then, whenever you talk about a contact transformation, it's, it's true to second order. You see, if, if, here's a curve here, okay, here's a curve here. They don't have the same curvature necessarily, so second derivatives don't match. But first and zeroth derivatives match. It's the same point, same, the same point and the same tan the, uh, derivative. This is a secant. This is a contact. This is a secant again, you see. So yeah, that is absolutely, and that's what it based in this thing right here. Is that it doesn't make any difference what I do with alpha when I'm there. If I am over uh, here someplace and I change alpha, wow, big change. New trajectory. Here, new trajectory doesn't move much. So only move to second order. So the first order, derivative zero. So that's the tricky part of this. It means you really have to understand how your functionality is going, what order it is. That's the tricky part. It's a good question. The rest of this is just some nice pictures and a little bit of geometry. We are about approaching the final minutes of our uh, ascribed uh, videoing time. But these are the plumes of Prometheus, as they uh, are, are called, Prometheus uh, Project. Here's the NASA uh, URLs. Where you can look at some other really nice ones. I, you see a little guy right here. See a little guy right here. Now, the assumption that all of the ejecta coming from a volcano uh, has the same speed is, of course, not true. So there's, there are actually subparabolas in here. Uh, but there's one for uh, that, that has a nice blue fluorescence that shows up rather, rather nicely. Um, this is um, the so-called alien. Okay. Now, the, whoever did the artwork here, uh, not good. Do these guys need a geometry lesson? So that's a that's a Las Vegas model for planetary ejection. Centers connected to the University of uh, Nevada, Las Vegas. But um, anyway, aside from that, uh, this is really a beautiful thing. Now, these are the the the, uh, ge the geometry. The kites are the geometrical trick uh, uh, that I uh, had um, shown you. And uh, this is lecture eight around page seventeen. Is really, I think, where this one came from. Uh, the um, kites that start out very long and American kite-like with a tangent line right there bisecting the kite and the uh, right angle right here to the focus and this being uh, a um, what I call subdirectrix or umbilical line is tangent to the actual parabola and then this is a directrix right here uh, for the parabola. So 
very good idea to get familiar with that before we look at the uh, sort of 20 questions to answer uh, where you would be, uh, where is the focus for the uh, project, the parabola that goes straight up. Remember where foci are, they're opposite the slope 1. Well, slope 1 can only be inside that pixel right there. So the focus is right there at the top. But later on, as you, you talk about this, uh, the um, focus will fall uh, along a curve that uh, has a nice definition. Now, where is the blast wave? I want to talk about the circular blast wave. You go and match this. That's another way to look at this thing. This is a contacting uh, between circles and uh, parabolic curves. Uh, we're going to get both of those at once. That's an advantage of the geometry. Okay. Anyway, here's the algebra that goes with that, that question right there. How high can alpha equal 45 path rise? Uh, you can answer that just from uh, signs on the energy and the sine of 45 degrees being 1 over the square root of 2. Where on the x-axis does alpha equal 45 uh, hit? Okay. Well, th this happens to be one of those kites, and I'm going to speed ahead here to get the kite picture again. And um, and it is right here. And you remember there was a kite picture. Keep going, passing. Uh, there was a kite that was associated with a square. This is where the American kite turns into a Chinese and uh, I should say Taiwanese maybe kite uh, that is uh, a rhombus instead of a usual sort of asymmetric kite. It becomes symmetric inside this region. So this one is just perfect for that kite. Okay? That is the thing that's going to tell uh, where you uh, where the geometry for that curve is. There's the 45 degree uh, gravel associated with unit slope, 45 degrees. It's got to come over here. So you know that's a part of the envelope right there. Anyway, I would mostly leave this as part of a problem. And these are partial answers uh, to this. Uh, once you know this particular point, you know that the blast wave, which is also contacting that thing, has to have a normal and the blast wave center has to go, uh, you know, has to fall from the time of, of the explosion. Uh, say this is an explosion of uh, ejecta, okay? The um, blast wave center has to fall, it's the center of gravity just has to fall like a normal thing. And it will actually be here uh, at the moment uh, that the uh, blast wave is as big enough just to be contacting that uh, uh, a parabola. So, you, you see, there are all kinds of things that geometry tells you. There's the blast wave right there. And you can just divine this from your head. You can look very smart by knowing uh, the, the little bit of geometry. Otherwise, it's a hell of a lot of calculus to prove things that we're uh, getting here. There's some more pictures of it. And there's a kite for way down here, okay? And there's a very big blast wave now. Uh, envelope contact and envelope focus must line up. That's a really important point we're going to be making throughout this course when we talk about uh, contacting uh, curves. There's another picture of a few of the uh, trajectories. So, uh, for the moment, uh, this is all I'm going to say on the contacting business, the envelope business, and here's sophomore physics taken to uh, really crazy extremes, but with geometry, not so crazy. Okay, any questions besides what's the answer to this? <laughs> did, did you say you were going to assign a problem for a, a shower inside?